Hey everyone, welcome to a very special edition of the HeelCast. I'm Impact Dude, and this week I am joined by the one and only Griggs. Griggs, you're back, buddy. Yeah, I'm back. I'm, you know me, I, I come out for all special occasions. I, and this is a special occasion because we have a very special guest this, this week. Oh yeah, we definitely have a special guest. I'm looking forward to this interview. It should be a fun one. So this week, folks, we have Chris Levin, a.k.a. Ref Riley. Chris, welcome to the HeelCast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. That's AKA a lot. Kid Ref, too. Kid Ref, <laughs> I know. So, 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 uh, so, 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 Chris, you are very, very, very popular on TNS, or ImpactAsylum.net, which is where we base our show out of. They love you over there. They Have you seen some of the pictures that they post? <laughs> no, I have not, but I'm definitely going to check them out after this interview. I mean, I kid you not, they, they posted a picture, and uh, you know how Sammy Han- Callahan calls himself the draw? Mm-hmm. Well, they put a picture of you up and put the real draw over top of it. <laughs> All right? So I'm flattered. So you, you're, you're talking, you got some big-time fans over there, and these guys are going to, they're going to mark out big time to hear this interview and hear what you have to say. Now, now look. We do our research, right, before we before we get into these things. And so, you know, we want to know what got you into the wrestling business. And, you know, you have a pretty cool story about being in the wrestling business. Um, well, there's a saying within pro wrestling, and that's, that is for anyone who's in it, it's because they don't have a choice. And that's definitely applicable to me. Um, I grew up just being absolutely fanatic in my uh, fanship of pro wrestling. I loved it. I watched anything I could get my hands on, whether it was – Contemporary stuff, uh, stuff from the 50s, things from overseas, uh, Lucha Libre in Mexico. I read everything I could, whether it was books, magazine articles, um, online news, everything and anything pro wrestling I could get my hands on was a treat for me. And when I was 15 years old, which was back in 2007, yes, I'm actually not a, <laughs> not a teenager or a tween, I'm 25 years old, um, Back in 2007, my mom was at the bank, and she saw a flyer for a local pro wrestling company. And this was, for me, really at the height of my um, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, like against the machine, you could say, uh, fandom portion, where it was like, oh, you know, the independents are so much better than the mainstream, you know, like that type of outlook. And finding out that a local independent company existed really blew my mind. And it was called Force One Pro Wrestling, and I went to their next show with a few friends, which was in October of 2007, and I was hooked. I loved every bit of it. I went home, and I found their WordPress website and their MySpace page, which is uh, dating how, uh, how long ago this was, and I found an announcement saying they needed a street team. Uh, so I went over there in November of 2007 at some point, and... I met with the owner, Tommy Cairo, who was uh, ECW original back when it was still Eastern Championship Wrestling. He was actually the guy who had the first ever Singapore Kane match with uh, the Sandman, and that led to Tommy Dreamer being involved and all of that good stuff. But um, yeah, I was hooked. He sold me on how great it was to be involved, and I, I showed up. I helped out with their street team. I cleaned up around the school that was uh, right 20 minutes from my house in Egg Harbor, New Jersey. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention, I apologize about that. I'm from South Jersey, right outside of Atlantic City. And yeah, uh, eventually they needed a ref for the practice matches, and that's kind of how where it all started for refereeing for me. So did it start as a part-time job, or did you see it always as you know something long-term that you wanted to do? Well, I mean, at first it wasn't really paying much at all because, like I said, I was only 15 years old, and who's going to pay the 15-year-old sure. kid the ref? It was just, you know, getting the experience, networking, um, you know, learning the craft. Um, and, I mean, you know, some some kids after school went to football practice or chess club, and I went to pro wrestling training. And on the weekends, I didn't go to parties. I went to pro wrestling shows. <laughs> that was um, my teenage experience for the most part. Now, what did your parents say about you – training to be a professional wrestler at 15 years old? They were concerned. Um, you know, my dad was a big <laughs> fan of pro wrestling, and he, you know, he thought it was pretty neat. 
my mom, on the other hand, was much more worried because, you know, I'm not a big guy. I'm five foot eight, 145 pounds. And back then when I was a teenager, I was even skinnier, believe it or not. I was that was probably 115, 120. And they were very concerned about that I would get hurt, that my bones would get broken and all of this stuff. Um, and, you know, and justifiably so. so. But um, I came out OK so far, at least. Now, did your parents make you go to college to have a backup plan or? No. Uh, well, it, it, my relationship with my parents, it wasn't really one like that with like, you have to do this, or you have to do that. They were, even if they were concerned, they were very um, open with allowing me to do my thing, you know. Um, and I did go to college. Well, initially, I went, I went for one semester to Rowan University uh, with a radio TV film major. And unfortunately, I had to drop out. It was a, um, I got bit by a tick and they're very prevalent out in my area and i got lyme disease which it's a thing that can be treatable and go away and in my case thankfully it did but it really um took me out of the action for a bit uh so i wasn't able to continue going to rowan but i did start going back to school um within the last few years i'm set to graduate next spring oh congratulations that's awesome oh thank you thank what's you, your uh, what's your major right now i'm going for an associates in history and my plan is to go for a um bachelor's after that probably something in the art history field very cool. Very cool. So I'd say you're a little bit more well-rounded than what the folks might be giving you credit for, right? Um, I try to be. You know, there's a lot of people in pro wrestling who can only talk about pro wrestling, which, you know, I don't blame them. I love pro wrestling. I'll talk about it all day. But I, I, I try to keep a wide uh, range of interests and hobbies outside of wrestling as well. So I understand that uh, that you're interested in getting into booking as well, right, and creative side. Do you see yourself down the road uh, venturing into that aspect of the business? Well, I've actually already ventured into it. Um, back in 2014, uh, me and a few friends, including uh, my girlfriend, uh, Bonesaw Jesse Brooks, helped run the first ever all-women's wrestling company to run in New York uh, City's history called Valkyrie Women's Professional Wrestling. And we ran uh, about a half dozen shows over the course of a year or so, and that was a really great um, informative thing that I was able to be a part of. It taught me a lot about the business and made a lot of mistakes, learned a lot of lessons, made a lot of good friends. And since then, I, I've ran a handful of small shows. I helped produce a small Lucha Libre uh, company that runs in the uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey area. And it, booking and promoting is, it can be super creatively fulfilling, but at the same time, it also can be very stressful. So it's not something that I do full-time or ever necessarily hope to do full-time but it really is a fun thing now you mentioned your girlfriend bone saw jesse brooks and from what i've heard you are very 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 into uh, women's wrestling and let me tell you something right now this is going to make you incredibly popular even more popular okay with the fans over impactasylum.net Tell us a little bit about your passion for women's wrestling, because I find it uh, intriguing and really, really cool at the same time. Well, for me, it's a thing of equality. Um, you know, coming into the business as a, you know, as a timid kid who socially awkward, uh, uh, undersized, I got bullied a lot. And not just because of the fact that those things I mentioned, but also I got kind of almost treated like a second class is and because I was a ref like my I was made to feel very often that my opinion meant less it was like I was less of a person and I came to the realization that women really are treated the same way incredibly often and for no other reason than the fact that they're a woman and I think it's awful and I hated that and I worked for a few women's wrestling companies and I I saw how sexist their practices were I mean when you hear a promoter say, I wouldn't book any woman that I wouldn't sleep with, it's, it just – it turns my stomach and just is like, this is you know, so unfair. And, and going back to even to the way mainstream wrestling treated women in the late 90s and early 2000s, constantly um, you know, uh, exploiting their sexuality, which you – know, sex, there's nothing wrong with sexuality and using it. But when that's the only course of action, when you say you're only as worthwhile as you are you know, sexually appealing, I think that's awful. And I was thinking, man, imagine if I was watching a wrestling show and you know, just trying to enjoy it. And there was a commentator who every minute during a man's match talked about how great their body was or how, you know, how hot they looked. And I was like, wow, that would really turn me away from wrestling. And it's really unfortunate that I'm, I'm sure a lot of women have you know, turned away in their fandom because of that over the years. 
Uh, and that that was a big reason why I wanted to promote uh, women's wrestling and just do everything I could to to help um, bolster it. Because so often, not only that, but you see people who get ahead in their careers, not because of their talented performers, but because you know they do exploit that sexuality. And again, nothing's wrong with exploiting sexuality, but I'm sure you know for for women who work really hard at their craft it's frustrating and i uh, sympathize with them over that so how did it feel this past week to get to ref the main event between rosemary and taya you know that was a that was a really great thing to be a part of i love the fact you know i'm all about girl power um and you know i i don't think that many of the women if any really knew me coming into uh impact wrestling my employment there except um you know, Allie, uh, we had, she had worked for Valkyrie and I'd worked with her, with her over the years in the Northeast. Um, and so I never really talked to anyone about my history with that, but it kind of just sort of, I gravitated towards the women's division. Um, I showed them a lot of respect and I don't know, they, they kind of adopted me as their guy. And, you know, I'm not on every woman's match, but it seems more often than that I'm in there. And it's, really a great feeling, especially working with Gail Kim, who produces the women's division there, the knockouts division, because you can tell this isn't just um, a paycheck for her. She's very passionate about what she does. It's like she's in there, even, you know, even when she's just helping, you know, put things together. It's like she's in there. And I really respect that about her. Um, so did you always want to be a referee or you were saying before, did you, did you want to be a wrestler first? And you fell you know, into becoming a referee? When I initially started, I mean, I, I didn't really look at it in any realistic uh, lens. I just, like, I love wrestling. I want to be involved with it. And sure, when I was a kid, yeah, I wanted to wrestle. But when I got in there and started training and, you know, taking all the bumps, I just realized that my body was just not made for it. I mean, um, my nickname amongst a lot of friends is uh, Baby Bird <laughs> because I'm built like a bird. <laughs> and, uh, and it, you know, it's an incredibly accurate statement. Uh, my body cannot handle those bumps and bruises and i mean don't get me wrong i completed my wrestling training and i still love going to a wrestling school and you know and rolling around and it's, it's something that i'm very passionate about but i know that i couldn't handle those bumps and bruises full time and even if i could i don't think many people are going to want to pay to see a uh, 145 pound uh, five foot eight performer hey they pay for rockstar spot so <laughs> <laughs> right which I have a lot of respect for, the fact that he's able to do it. Maybe he's built better than me, or maybe he's just tougher than me. But uh, it's something I have a lot of respect for, that um, anyone who can go out there and do that. Well, Chris, I'm, I'm built about the same way that you are, man, only maybe a little taller, right? Uh, and uh, and I know how my body feels. I'm, I'm not 25 anymore, but um, I can only imagine what it would be like to just get your butt kicked, you know, around the ring every night. Now, you, you, you are – a quote unquote, just a referee, right? According to what the people in the back say, but we both know that first of all, there's a lot to being a referee, right? You guys are the ring general, but you do take some bumps in there. I mean, it's got to get physical from time to time. A lot better than my desk, a lot more than my desk, my desk job for darn sir. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> oh yeah. All the time. I, I mean, I, I couldn't even begin to tell you how many times I've taken bumps or uh, been on one side or the other of a move or anything like that. It just comes with the territory. Do you, do you like that aspect of it? Um, I don't dislike it. Um, like I'm not going. Uh, to me, it's more about does it make sense? Like as long as something is safe, I'm willing to do it. Um, like for example, I I work a lot of deathmatch wrestling shows. Um, that I I guess that's kind of how I really started uh, making my bones out on a national stage. And a few months ago, there was a match where they wanted me to uh, give someone a DDT, and I knew that. There was like there would be you know a bit of debris, a bit of glass, uh, thumbtacks and things like that on the mat when I did it. But I looked at it and saw okay you know I'll, I'll get a few scratches, but you know the scratches will go away and they'll fade within a week or whatever. But it's nothing that's dangerous. So as long as it's not anything that's long term dangerous uh, or you know severe like concussions or broken bones or anything like that, I'm I'm fine with. It's about what adds to the story, I guess you could say. If it makes sense and really adds to the moment. And to the story, then I'm all for it. So we won't, no. we won't see in Bar Ma Wire Massacre 4. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I mean, if they wanted to do uh, a Bar Wire Massacre, another one, I'd love to ref it. But if that's not, awesome. that's fine, too. Yeah, I have no <laughs> problem with that. I do uh, 
barbed wire matches, stuff with fire, all glass, all kinds of stuff all the time. I even I did a few tours of Mexico actually with um, DTU, which is a uh, deathmatch company down there. It was a lot of fun. Wow, I would say wear your car hearts if you're going to do barbed wire <laughs> massacre <laughs> and save yourself, Chris. Save yourself. Now, now I, I think that in, in my opinion, you know, refereeing is a hard job. So. You know, I think you got to keep everybody in check, right? You got to keep the time. You got to be watching what's going on. Lord only knows promoter might change the finish mid-match. I'm sure it happens from time to time. What's the hardest part about being a ref? You know, um, for me, I don't, I don't mean to brag or anything, but refing was never uh, particularly difficult for me. And I don't think that's because I'm quite adept to it. Maybe, I don't know. It's, it's all I've known my entire adult life is my main thing has been refereeing, you know? So I'm sure if you were to ask anyone who's done something their whole life, whether it's refereeing or surfing, whatever they would say that it's easy as cake. Um, I guess the most difficult thing is consistency. Um, because it, it does take a lot longer for referees to get their due in, in pro wrestling, um, in terms of recognition from fans, in terms of getting into positions that uh, monetarily compensate them well, and just sticking through everything, through you know the extended amount of time, through people who are going to show you less respect because of what you do, um, that's probably the most difficult part. Um, how long do you see yourself uh, roughing in your in your career? Career, like I know you went back to school, you're going back to school now. Um, do you see it as something so long term? Do you want to keep continue doing, or? Oh yeah, I have no, I have no plans on stopping, and um, I'm not uh, until I'll, I'll be refereeing until the day that, for whatever reason, I do not contribute uh, to the match. So whether it's if I get too old or too injured, that's the day I'll stop refereeing. But as long as I can help contribute to a good match, then I want to be in there. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Some, oh, sorry, I was just saying you, you have some big shoes to fill because. You had, uh, you know, like I think he replaced Earl Hefner on uh, for the ladies matches. So on the Impact card, so that's some big shoes to fill there. I would never see it as um replacing Earl Hefner because oh. you know obviously I have a world uh, of respect for Earl Hefner and every single other referee who's come before me and done this at a high level and has a reputable performance such as Earl does. Um, and my only regret is that I wish I had been there sooner just to meet Earl and learn from him. I've only ever met him in passing. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't ever say I replaced Earl. I would just say that uh, he was here in the past, and now I am. Well, you can you may not say it, but but I will, because I'll be honest with you, you know, uh, Earl Hebner in Impact Asylum was, was legend, and, and deservedly so, right? Uh, but you'd be shocked at how fast you're becoming Legend 2.0. And, and you're young, you know. They've nicknamed you Kid Ref. I mean, you've got a lot of years ahead of you. Right, a lot of years to go to, to to break it before it's all said and done. I mean, you have that opportunity starting so young uh, and have already achieving as much as you've achieved to, to to make it to that next step. You know, should you continue to do it when it sounds like you're interested? Uh, my question for you, Chris, is what are your thoughts on Impact fans nicknaming you Kid Ref? How how do you feel about that? Um, you know. I've, you know, obviously I've dealt with my whole life people, whether it's making fun of me or even discriminating me because of the fact that I'm a small guy and I have a baby face. So, you know, I'm pretty used to it by this point. It doesn't bother me. Um, if, you know, as a referee, our job is just to kind of facilitate the action and make sure everything goes smoothly. Um, and we're not often put in a position where we're able to directly contribute to the show in a way that's meaningful from the crowd's perspective. So um, intentionally or not, if I'm able to do that in a way that makes anyone happy, that really does mean a lot to me. That's something special that I'm very thankful for. That's awesome. Yeah, I think yeah. it definitely works for your character, though. Even, you know, your referee character that you're playing. I mean, it. I don't know. It helps. I think it helps the fans, you know, feel like they. it's something they could do, too. That's cool. Oh. I mean, like I said, I'm not even playing a character out there. I use my real name, uh, Ref Chris Levin. Um, Josh Matthews and Sanjay like to bust on me a bit by calling me Ref Riley. Um, but yeah, I just go out there and I be myself. And if people like that, that's, that means a lot because it means they like me. And I'm, I'm, you know, as a, as someone who grew up very shy, very timid, um, even now it takes me a while to get used to talking to people and open up. That's really cool to be accepted like that. And I'll tell you right now that the whole kid ref thing, that is them accepting you. 
right? If they if they're if they're talking about you and they're talking about you that way, you've been accepted. And and I and I feel like you know, and and I understand. I and I had the I don't anymore, but I had the same baby face that you did, you know. But I didn't have any facial hair. And um and the bottom line is is that I get where you're coming from, but the fact that they think that way about you man, is very complimentary. It's very complimentary, and I I would take it as such, and I would run with it, man, because it's that's that's the best feature that you got going for you. It makes you stand out. Versus the other referees, it just blend in the background, bud. So I, keep on keeping on that way. That. I appreciate that, and I'm really thankful to work with the referees that I do at Impact, uh, whether it's Brandon Toll or Johnny Bravo or uh, Mark Harris. They're they're all great guys and tremendous officials. And um, the only thing I can say in terms of the kid ref stuff is that I think it's funny. And if anyone, you know, please if please po- feel free to post it online. Um, Tag me on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. On Facebook, I'm at my real name, uh, Chris Levin. That's K-R-I-S, uh, Chris and Levin, L-E-V-I-N. And Instagram on Twitter, uh, I use Ref Chris Levin uh, for both of those. So please feel free to post them and just tag me in it because I have a laugh at it. It's fun. So so what were um, growing up, what were some of the, your favorite wrestlers that you uh, looked up to? Uh, you know, I was a huge fan of The Undertaker growing up. Like, I remember my earliest experiences of, of a fan was probably in the mid-90s. And, you know, I was a toddler, and I kept confusing The Undertaker and The Terminator because both <laughs> were just these big, you know, imposing figures. I remember my father always <laughs> correct me on them. But, um, you know, as I as I um, smartened up, I guess you could say, to the business a little bit more from a fan side, um, I became a huge fan of Ric Flair, um, I started learning about ECW and places outside of um, WWE. Uh, you know, uh, Sabu was someone I love to watch through his work. Um, I discovered Ring of Honor, and I was a huge fan of Jimmy Jacobs, which because just because of the fact not only is he a great performer, but he you know he was a small guy who's about the same size as I am now, and to see he was out there doing it was very inspirational to me. Which it's really cool to be able to work with him uh, now at Impact. So who do you like working with the most at Impact uh, Wrestling today? Like like who are who are who are the guys you just really enjoy working with? Um, you know, I I love anytime I work with um the Jersey guys. I get along with all of them just because we've been working together for so many years. Guys like Fala, uh KM, uh you know, I've known Sammy Cow Sammy Callahan helped train me. So uh, you know, I've always had a, a good rapport with him. Um I mean, there's there's no one that I don't like working there. Everyone's very nice, very laid back, very professional. Um, it it really is a treat. I, you know, Rosemary's like the nicest person in the world. Um, um, Laurel Van Ness, she was the person who she's not with the company anymore. But when I first got there, she was one of the first people to kind of take me in and make me feel like I belonged. She was the first person to say, "I want him refing my all of my matches," and we just clicked. And they're very nice person. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to slight anyone by leaving them out, but yeah, it's, everyone's great. I, I mean, one of the guys that I keep in touch with, even if we're not at Impact, is Johnny Ref Johnny Bravo. Like, anytime I have a question, and even if it's not referee stuff, like just wrestling stuff or life stuff, I give Uncle Johnny a call and uh, just, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, shoot the breeze with him. We usually at least once a week or once every other week. Uh, Brandon Toll is another one, another guy. I'll just we just call and just chat. Um, it, it's like a family there. It's really nice there. That's awesome. Well, you mentioned Rosemary, and of course, you know we we love Rosemary. You know she's my sister, right? I did not know that. Is that yeah, true? You, that you should you when you talk when you see her, tell her you talk to her brother. I will do that. She will. She will. She will clue you in on the whole kit and caboodle. Okay. Uh, now, R- Rosemary. Rosemary is is fantastic. Laurel Van Ness the same way. You know, it's it's just just two phenomenal people that, uh, that, that that I just think are awesome. Um, now you mentioned that you're from the Jersey area, right? And you, you dropped some names of some Jersey promotions you work for, but I mean, you've wrapped all over the place. You've been Mexico, right? Oregon, where, what promotions have you worked for and, uh, and where might you look forward to working for in the future? I've been really fortunate to really get out there. Um, a lot throughout my career doing a lot of traveling. Um, I, I guess the first time I really got outside of New Jersey was when Sammy Callahan took me to CZW. And from there, I met um, Derek Moore, who's a, who's, he used to referee on the Indies as D. Edwards. He's in um, WWE now as under his given name. Uh, he got me out to um, Pennsylvania and Maryland for the first time. And then I started traveling with a group of guys like uh, David Starr and Shane Strickland. And we went out 
we went all over to West Virginia, to Michigan, to Florida, um, and just about every, everywhere in between. Um, I was really lucky to work for West Coast Wrestling Connection out in Oregon and Paragon Pro Wrestling out in Las Vegas. Uh, recently, I've been to Canada a few times for Impact and for Alpha One uh, with one of my best friends in the world, Anthony Green. Um, yeah, I've just been really fortunate to travel, and I, you know, I still love doing it. Um, in a few weeks, I'll be going to Chicago with uh, GCW Game Changer Wrestling, which is kind of my home promotion in the New Jersey area. Um, and I haven't been to Chicago in quite a while. It's been a few years. I think last time I was there was working with freelance wrestling, and I'm excited to be back. To, and to I didn't really get to try the deep dish pizza the last time, so I'm really excited to do that. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> you uh, worked for uh, in New Orleans for a WrestleMania weekend. Um, how was that this year? And have you ever wrestled at WrestleMania weekend before? That was a wild experience. Like it didn't feel like I got there uh, Wednesday night because I had um, I had events uh, starting Thursday, and from Wednesday to when I left on Sunday afternoon, it it didn't feel like a, a half week. It felt like one long day because you know you didn't really get the opportunity to sleep, like uh, to sleep or anything like that. It was just constant stuff. Whether it was going to shows or going out and catching up with old friends. Um, so it, it was one long party and it was a blast. It was exhausting, but it was a blast. I think I must have slept 12 hours when I finally did get home. Um, but yes, I did wrestle. Uh, I did uh, officiate for one WrestleMania weekend prior to that. It was the first time that WrestleMania happened in the North Jersey area. Um, geez, I think it was 2013. Um, but yeah, I was there as uh, an official for CZW. That was when I worked for them. And I also wrestled that night as part of the uh, Kaiju Big Battle. I was in the main event as one of Dr. Cube's minions, and that was a blast. That's awesome. Now, first of all, I got to throw this out. I have complete newfound respect for Josh Matthews after what he did WrestleMania weekend. I mean, that man was on the air for like 17 hours a day. It was insane. Literally, his entire life was on the air. What's it like working with Impact Wrestling? You know, you have a lot of a lot of big block tapings. Uh, you know, what's the what's the atmosphere like? And, you know, how is it being down there for those blocks of tapings? Uh, it's great working for them. them. They are, without question, the most professional organization I've ever been with. Um, just in the way everything is structured, the, um, the, the amount of organization and professionalism, it's great. I mean, I love it. I really do. Everyone's nice and they're laid back, but not so laid back to the point of not caring. It's professionally laid back, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, it's just a blast. And, you know, as the week stretch, stretches on, if we're like, say, a six or seven day shoot, like obviously people are getting exhausted, more and more exhausted, but they, they still put in all of their effort. They still give it 110%, myself included. I know um, the last time that I was uh, did a, a long stretch was in January. And a few days into it, I got like a cold or whatever. And like it, it wiped me out like with like a, like a fever and went out for like two days straight. And then finally, like uh, I had a day where I was feeling good. And then Florida just got hit with like a cold spike out of nowhere. That was very unusual for that climate. And I got, I got sick again. So like I spent like maybe four out of the seven days I was there with a, with a fever. But, uh, you know, I, I still trooped on and got through it all. Now, how did you uh, get in touch with Impact? Did they see your work and they wanted you to, to come in to work for them, or did you try out? I had a professional relationship with one of the office uh, members going back just to working with him over the years on the independent scene. And I had worked with uh, – when Global Force Wrestling first split from Impact, I had worked with them for a few of their uh, untelevised events, uh, one in a baseball stadium and then another at the uh, Mid-Hudson Civic Center. And then when Impact started running live shows again, uh, in, they ran two in New York, and I was brought on for both of those. And that was this past summer. And then a few months later was when they had a bit of a change of regimes, and they uh, changed some of the staff, and I was one of the uh, new staff members they brought in. So... Uh... You mentioned a bunch of uh, you've, you've been around for a couple of well, like a couple of years, but I was so you've been reffing for uh, about, about 10, 15 years now. Uh, what were some of the, what would you feel like is your biggest match? 
Oh geez, I've been really lucky to be in been in a lot in the in the squared circle with a lot of really big exciting matches. Um, I, I well, first I'm I'm gonna of course say it, the first time I refereed live on pay per view with Impact at um, Bound for Glory was amazing. Just every match I refereed there was one of the biggest matches of my career. Um, then this past Impact taping in January, where I was able to officiate for. Johnny Impact versus Austin Aries, and later um, Austin Aries versus Matt Seidel in a title versus title match. Uh, those were two huge ones. Um, aside from that, um, I, please indulge me for a moment while I just go over my head. Um, uh, this uh, at New Orleans, uh, officiating for the main event of GCW Bloodsport uh, with Matt Riddle versus Minoru Suzuki was a really awesome thing for me i'm a i'm a casual fan of mma but i really respect it and for blood sport what they did was they removed the ropes uh for the entire event and it was knockout or submission only for the entire show and it was all uh mma guys and really hard-hitting uh professional wrestlers just going at it uh refereeing the main event was a huge challenge and something that was really exciting and um, the next day at GCW, uh, Joey Janela's spring break, I was able to officiate the main event in front of, you know, I don't know the official number, but it had to have been over 2,000 people in attendance. Um, Joey Janela versus Great Sasuke, which was, you know, just, uh, you know, I've known, worked with Joey for years, and Sasuke's an absolute legend. Um, just to name a few other matches that were really important to me were, would be um, uh, anything I did with Valkyrie, especially that first women all women's event in new york city was really exciting um jersey all pro wrestling when they trusted me to officiate low-key versus ray mysterio uh, a few years back that was incredible um my first tour of mexico um in Kataro, we did a match where i went rudo in the main event and <laughs> sided with team gcw when they were going versus team dtu and um you know standing in the middle of the ring uh flipping off the hundreds of fans in attendance that was pretty uh, thrilling and uh, while the match itself you know it was a great match but it wasn't a huge show or anything but just for the surrounding context um, the night that New York State Athletic Commission threatened to uh, ban me from the state um, and the match that happened uh, regarding that that was pretty cool tell us about that that sounds um, interesting um, in sure in August of 2016, there was a an event in Brooklyn, New York, and you know just business as usual. Uh, my girlfriend Jess was having a match against Mark House, uh, who I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. I don't believe he wrestles anymore, but he really was a tremendous worker. And you know we were all excited for the match. Um, we get there and get in the ring, ring the bell. They're working for about a minute when all of a sudden the bell rings. And I look up, and the state inspectors from the State Athletic Commission, they stopped the match. And, you know, I, I poke my head out the ring, and I'm like, you know, what, what's the meaning of this? Why is this happening? And they said, well, in New York State, you can't have a man wrestle a woman. That's against the law. And I immediately knew that was untrue. Just, you know, from promoting shows there, I knew, the, I knew that rule book, and I knew that wasn't factual. So I did the only thing that seemed... Uh, sent school at the time, which was to pick up the microphone. And I looked at um, Mark and Jess and I said, uh, are you doing this or am I? And they kind of gave me the nod. And I called them out saying that this was state-sponsored sexism and discrimination. And you can't treat uh, women this way just because of the fact that they are a woman. And it, it, they, you know, we all went to the back and they, they pulled up, a, they said I was, you know, banned from New York State, which, you know, I, I knew at the time they couldn't do. You don't need a license to perform in New York. So they were just, so rather they didn't know the rules or they were lying to scare me. I'm not sure which it was, but <laughs> they pulled up the rule book after searching for 30 minutes to look for some type of justification. And they found in the boxing and wrestling uh, guidelines, something that stated that a male boxer cannot compete against a female boxer. And they tried to say that that was the reason. And I pointed out, well, yeah, but it says boxer specifically, and this isn't a boxing event. And they're like, it doesn't matter. It's in the book um, for both. I said, okay, but why is it specifically state boxer then? That doesn't make sense. And, you know, they wouldn't have any of it. So they get on the phone with their superiors who call their superiors who call a lawyer. And I just happened to remember that a friend of mine was in attendance who also was a lawyer. 
<laughs> and I, I brought her backstage to have them talk about it. And they're like, she can't, she's not allowed back here. <laughs> and I said, you don't have the authority to do that. This isn't even your show. You know, like, you're an inspector here. And they're like, yes, we do. I go, okay, then call the cops and make her leave. And, you know, of course they couldn't because they were lying. So they just left the backstage area because they didn't want to be around a lawyer. And, um, you know, after going back and forth, I think their boss just said, just stop, you know, cut the drama, just let the match go on. And the match went on as the main event of the night. And it was an incredible match with just a, a stellar emotional, like, you know, charge, like, because, you know, the whole crowd was behind it. They wanted to see the match happen and even more so because they were trying to prevent it from happening. And it, it was a great night of wrestling. I was really thankful to be in there for that one. That is an awesome story. That is a phenomenal story, man. <clears throat> man, how to follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess I have to follow it up somehow. So, okay, so first of all, that's got to be the, 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 the coolest moment, like, ever. Um, what's, who's the biggest star that you've wrapped? Oh, geez. You know, I've, I've gone in the ring with so many guys, whether it's, uh, you know, like legends like Hacksaw, Jim Duggan, Gangrel, uh, Alberto Patron, Tommy Dreamer, Rey Mysterio. Um, y- you know, for me, um, there, yeah, again, there's so many. I could, I could go on and on listing guys who I grew up watching, uh, men and women who I grew up watching and idolizing, being able to step in the ring with them and becoming friends with them and stuff like that. But a lot of the time, it's I get I wouldn't say starstruck, but it means more to me when I'm in there officiating a match with the guys who have all the talent that they should have really gone somewhere, but for whatever reason didn't. Um, or you know we're we're just um, locally uh, famous or locally used. Like I, if you ask me to get in the ring with two TV guys, that's business as usual. If you ask me to get in there with uh, Mr. Ooh La La, then I'm like, oh my god, yeah, that's awesome. I was able to referee a match last month with Mr. Ooh La La and Blue Meanie, who were both <laughs> um, comedic legends within pro wrestling. Um, Mr. Ooh La La specifically within the Northeast, and that was that was stellar. Um, here, the, well, they're both, you know, these guys are both famous, but um, refereeing the first ever one-on-one match with Homicide and one of his mentors, Manny Fernandez. Um, earlier this or last year, I guess it was, that was really special too. Like things like that, that, that really mean a lot to me. So if you could go back in the past and referee one match from the past, any match, what would you pick? Oh, geez. Um, definitely a match with Buddy Rogers. If I, uh, or gorgeous George, but if I had to pick, um, there's a few with Buddy Rogers, um, Buddy Rogers versus Ric Flair. Um, Buddy Rogers versus Pat O'Connor, uh, Buddy Rogers versus Luthez, uh, something like that. Because I really, I really do respect and admire the guys who got it started. And I think that he gets a lot of credit, but not nearly enough. Uh, Buddy Rogers in terms of putting together what professional wrestling as we know it now is, I think a lot of that's due to him and just to be in there with, with that, that legend, that genius, that would be incredible. Well, I think our listeners would like to know, um, who do you uh, watch for inspiration? Um, you mean in terms of referees? Uh, the referees that I study most, um, my top three would probably be uh, John Cohn, who I think is just, uh, he's an, I think he's flawless in the ring. Um, Nick Patrick, who his style isn't necessarily the style that is done today, but I think when you look at, you know, art history, you really need to take it within the context of its time. And I think his style was excellent. And I wish I could still referee in the style Nick Patrick does. It's very authentic. Um, and it's very gritty and just, I love it. I love Nick Patrick's work. Um, Jason Ayers, he's one of uh, my mentors and I, he's a daily inspiration. Uh, he, when they put out a trading card of him, I put it, I have it framed on my wall and I look at it every day just to know that as a referee, you can make it too. You know, um, so those three referees for sure are the ones I watch the most. That's awesome. So, so how many nights a week are you refing these days? Uh, it depends. If I go on the road, uh, I mean, there's going to be a point coming up where I have a show on the 20th and um, I don't have a day off until the 29th. That's later this month. Um, you know, there's times I've been in Mexico where I was literally on the road for two weeks straight, two and a half weeks straight. 
Um, I'd say on average, maybe two to three nights a week, um, a slow week. Maybe I'll only have one show, which is, you know, my body's thankful for, but at the same time, I'm any day I have off, I'm always available for a booking. If anyone needs someone to count up to three, five, 10, and sometimes 20. So gr- growing up, uh, uh, were you a fan of, uh, WCW and WWE or did you have one of, of the favorite? You know, I wasn't watching regularly enough to be a fan of WCW when they were around. I would say that when I started really watching it weekly would be about 2002, right after they went down. Okay. Impact, I know you were a big fan of WCW back in the day, too. Oh, I watched WCW all the time. I still watch WCW all the time. <laughs> In fact, if you ask me what my favorite promotion is, I will still tell you it's WCW. Uh, so many, so many great memories in WCW. Now, you know, Chris, you mentioned that you started watching around 2002. So, did you watch mainly WWE? Did you watch Impact back in those days, or was it pretty much look the only thing that was truly on TV and accessible was WWE? Well, I started out with WWE probably around uh, around the time that the rise and fall of ECW came out was when I discovered ECW and really loved them. And around that time, YouTube popped up, so I was able to access um, the independence. I discovered Ring of Honor. Um, I discovered Impact when they were on Fox Sports, uh, when they were still TNA. And, uh, God, it would probably be around 04, 05. Um, that was when I discovered, uh, TNA and I loved it. I, to see all these new characters that I was unfamiliar with, to see a much more fast paced athletic style, it was all really exciting. And especially the way that the, uh, shows were formatted on, um, Fox sports at the way they would have the, they would have bars on the bottom and top of the screen telling you the, the name of the competitor, the time limit of the match, other facts. And it, it really gave it a legitimate sports feel that really intrigued me, really made it stand out. So you mentioned before that you were in part trained by Sammy Callahan. Who else trained you? Well, Sammy took me under his wing around 2010 or 11. Um, you know, for the first few years, it was just, you know, just one, maybe two shows a month around the New Jersey area when I, you know, I was still a kid in high school. And, um, as I was, I was, I was a senior in high school was when, uh, Sammy got involved with force one. He moved from the Midwest to New Jersey and really took me under his wing. Um, prior to that, the guy who really took me under the wing is, uh, the most would be Tommy force, who was a, um, a New Jersey area competitor trained by Mike Sharp in the mid nineties. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't work anymore, but he was, you know, he's very talented, um, and very underappreciated. He came along in, in that time where not all the indie guys out there really got their due. Um, but the people I really credit for taking me under their wing, uh, Tommy Force, then Sammy. Uh, Sammy introduced me to Jason Ayers, who I owe the world to. Um, and and going out to the Pennsylvania area was where I met John Trotsky. Uh, John used to wrestle in the late 90s throughout the 2000s as supremely great uh, and he was really an innovative um, high flyer, and he he now he wor- he still is involved with pro wrestling. He promotes the sanctuary out in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and he runs the Angry Wrestling Vet uh, webpage. But he's in more involved with the film industry now. He was he was the, if you watch the wrestler, he was the referee for the main event of that. Uh, the or I don't know, not the main event, the last match of the movie. Um, he was also the guy who trained Mickey Rourke for the role. Um, so, yeah, I would say those guys are the ones who've had the most direct influence on me. Now, in your classes, uh, was there anybody else of note that was in your wrestling classes? You know, whether it be wrestlers, managers, valets, etc. cetera. Uh, and anybody we should watch out for maybe still coming up? You know, not really. I mean, not anyone that – I don't want to say not really in the sense that there was no one else there. Most of the people have um, – have left the business since then. Um, I'm trying to think of who's actively involved right now from Force One. Uh, Jeff Bravo and Josh Adams, who are both very talented uh, workers who are working in the New Jersey area mostly. Um, MLJ, who's a uh, ring announcer and commentator. He works for CZW and a handful of others that lives 20 minutes from me. I still get together and watch old wrestling with him all the time. Um, 
Dave Dahl, he came along a few years after me at Force One, and um, uh, Jimmy Lyons, he's another one who came at a few years after me uh, at Force One. Um, Matt Saigon, who used to work as Ryu Lee in uh, New Jersey area, he's just started to come back as well. Um, yeah, the, unfortunately, there's not a ton of Force One uh, originals around anymore who came from that school. So you spent a lot of time on the road. Uh, what would you say is the best part of being on the road, and what is the worst part of being on the road? The best part is definitely all the unique experiences that you're not going to get otherwise, whether it's bonding with friends, making new friends, um, seeing sites. Like, if it wasn't for wrestling, I would have never walked along the you know Aztec pyramids. I would have never um, – got a um, VIP pass to Universal Studios and get to, you know, like just things like that, that I, I was never probably would have never walked the strip in Las Vegas. Um, so many unique things like that, that would have never happened to me if not for pro wrestling and being able to do that with some of my best friends in the world. That's definitely the best part. Um, the worst part, I'm a homebody. So on the average day, I'm not I'm not someone who who loves to go out and party and things like that. So being away from it from home is in itself a struggle at times, but it, it's worth it. So you mentioned you know the best part of being on the road is being on you know with some of your very best friends. So you know who do you tend to hang out with during the impact tapings? Um, well, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the Jersey guys, um, and also like I mentioned earlier, I am. I, I'm fine with, you know, public speaking, stuff like that. But when it gets to hanging out with people, it takes me a while to get to know people and feel comfortable doing that. So I'm, you know, I'm still in that process of feeling comfortable enough to feel like, yeah, I actually do belong here. You know, like I just kind of hit that point at the last taping when when everyone was just kind of being nice to me and treated me like not like I'm an outsider, but like hey, I'm one of the guys. Um, so, yeah, mostly the Jersey guys. Um uh, LAX of um, of uh, or, uh, Santana and Ortiz, uh, Homicide, um, Fala, uh, Ref Johnny Bravo, Brandon Toll, guys like that. Um, I would say are the ones I hang out with the most, probably. See, I think that you'd get in a lot of trouble hanging out with LAX and Sammy <laughs> Callahan. You know what I'm saying? I'd be hanging out with Fala by myself. Oh, I love Fala. Yeah, I mean, I love all of them. Like, I was working with. Um, LAX back when they were still EYFBO. Um, God, I've been working with them for years, five or six years now. Um, and that, you know, that New York, New Jersey, PA area. Now, we're, we're talking about tapings here. We have some tapings coming up, right? We got a pay per view this Sunday. Everybody needs to buy the pay per view. And where can they buy the pay per view, by the way? You know, speak to your local cable providers, but I also believe it's on Fight TV, and if you purchase there, that's uh, Redemption this Sunday, April 22nd, and I'm really psyched for that because the last time I did pay-per-view with Impact was my first time working with them in a televised front, so, you know, I got through it okay, but I was nervous, and now I feel much more prepared, and I'm excited to be there. Oh, and I can tell you right now, I'll be getting on the Fight Network, and I'm telling everybody to get on the Fight Network because all the proceeds go directly to anthem <laughs> no need to share with the cable company send it all directly to anthem now chris last question for you bud following up these uh, these uh this pay-per-view we're gonna have a set of tapings right mm -hmm. and how many weeks worth of tapings are we getting this time you know i i'm not i don't have the formats in front of me so i don't know exactly how that all works out but i know that we're taping from the 23rd to the 26th Right. And my understanding is that that'll take us up to, but not including Slammiversary. Is that correct? Um, you know, honestly, I couldn't tell you. I'm not sure on that. Impact, I don't think there is. I think there's two more tapings that they're doing somewhere else before Slammiversary. Well, I'm really, what I'm really trying to figure out is, is there going to be any tapings like the last week in June? Because I'm going to be in Florida. And I'm trying to convince the wife to drive up to Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no. To my knowledge, there's nothing on the schedule for um, last week of June in Orlando. So sorry about that one. Oh, man. You're killing me. You're <laughs> killing me, Chris. Damn it. Yeah. This interview is going so well. <laughs> this interview is going so well. Yeah, it was my choice to be impact tapings every week, and I'd be right up there with them. Someday, right. though. Someday. Yeah, I thought I saw something about Canada, two shows or something like that, and they were doing tapings up there. But could be wrong. 
we can we can find our way up to Canada, Greg. So you and I yeah. thought about going up to Canada for Bound for Glory, if I remember correctly. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, we're both from the uh, Northeast too. So uh, he's from Maryland. I'm from Pennsylvania. So okay, not, where not where I did not Pennsylvania? Um, Northeast of the Scranton area. Oh, okay, so you're way out there. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and I'm guessing that you do the Maryland shows down in Joppa, right? For MCW. Me. Yeah, you mentioned you did some shows in Maryland. Uh, years ago. I don't work for MCW currently. Um, mm-hmm. I did a few shows with them years ago. I went with um, Sammy, Rich Swan, and a handful of other guys. Yeah, I'm about 20 minutes from there, so you will find your way back down there. Give me a shout. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So, so Griggs, you got anything else for Chris tonight? Uh, well, you we, we mentioned before where, where our, our listeners can uh can find you. Can you want to tell us uh, one more time where they can find you on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook? Sure. Um, my full, my name is Chris Levin. That's K R I S L E V I N. And you can find me under that name on Facebook. And I get a ton of friend requests. So please um, just shoot, feel free to shoot me a message and that way it will expedite me adding you and all that good stuff. And on Instagram and Twitter, you can find me at ref Chris Levin. And that's R-E-F-K-R-I-S-L-E-V-I-N. And yeah, if there's any memes or whatever, I you know I take it all in good humor. So please feel free to tag me in them. Awesome. Well, Chris, I'm going to tell you that I just hit the send request on Facebook for you. All right. So that is Impact Dude. Um, it has been an absolute blast having you on, man. Your story is fantastic. I, I particularly love you know your feelings on the knockouts. And uh, that story about you and the, you know, the New York Athletic Commission is just epic. Uh, good for you, uh, and, and 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 you know what? And better for everybody else, right? That you that you, that you stood up for. So, um, look, man. Like once again, thank you very much, uh, folks. That's it for this interview. Uh, on behalf of uh, ImpactAsylum.net, the entire heel cast, especially my good buddy Griggs, and the man himself, referee Chris Levin. I'm Impact Dude saying have a great week and we'll catch you next time.